I mean, I mean, it's just so amazing. The creationists were right all along. To be honest, they just didn't have the argumentative skills. Argumentative skills. Argumentative skills. About 15 billion years ago, there were no stars in the sky. There wasn't even a sky. All that existed was the primordial fireball. Primordial fireball. Primordial then, fireball. Primordial then, something happened. In a flash, everything suddenly expanded. This was how it all began. The first moment of existence. What we now call the Big Bang. The Big Bang. beginning of the 20th century, scientists believed that the universe had always existed, that matter energy was, was infinite, it had always been around. Um, the model is called the steady state model, because the model of the universe that it's been around forever basically doesn't change. The universe is steady state. But what happened in the last hundred years is that model has been blown away because of the evidence. Observations now suggest, as you all know, that the universe began some 12 to 15 billion years ago. The first evidence that the universe had a beginning is the expanding universe. Researchers wanted to believe in a universe that always was and always will be, eternal. But galaxies flying away from each other meant that once, long ago, they were clumped together. It meant something started them moving. The universe had a beginning. Today, it's called the Big Bang Theory. This was first discovered in 1929 by Edwin Hubble and uh, it's the first evidence that the um, universe had a beginning. The second evidence the universe had a beginning is the cosmic background radiation. The discovery of the cosmic background radiation was a fatal blow to those who wanted to believe in an eternal universe. The Big Bang proponents had won. Now the final evidence for the origin of the universe is the relative abundance of light elements. It's very clear now that the universe had an origin, and scientists have become to accept this. In fact, the equations of general relativity that Einstein developed had an origin of the universe. When Einstein developed his equations of general relativity, they showed that there should be an expansion of the universe and an origin, and Einstein didn't like that. He added something called a cosmological constant, which he later realized was not there. When we, were, when we saw that the universe was expanding, that there really was an origin, he threw out the cosmological constant, he said that that was the biggest mistake of his scientific career, was introducing that, was introducing that, was introducing that, was introducing that, was introducing that. But when this Big Bang model was first proposed in the early part of the 20th century, it was received with great skepticism by the scientific community. Because the scientific community knew that the Big Bang opened up the possibility of having a beginning and a creator and someone who began it. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why everything exists instead of just nothing? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. For example, Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist on the radio program, he said the universe is just there and that's all. But the astrophysical evidence indicates that the universe began to exist in a great explosion called the Big Bang 15 billion years ago. Most laymen do not appreciate that not only were all matter and energy created in that event, but physical space and time themselves. This is of utmost importance, for it implies, as the Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle points out, that the Big Bang theory requires the creation of the universe from nothing. Now, this tends to be very awkward for the atheist. For as Anthony Kenny of Oxford University urges, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. Even atheist philosophers, such as David Hume, he wrote in a letter, I never asserted to absurd proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. Similarly, 
P.J. Zort in his publication about time said, if there is anything we find inconceivable, it is that something could arise from nothing. So where did the universe come from? Why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. It doesn't mean it's God, it doesn't mean it's Jesus, it doesn't mean it's Allah, it doesn't mean anything. It just means there's a cause for the universe. So we ask another question, what is the nature of this cause? And the nature of this cause upon conceptual analysis, which means critical thinking, thinking about this cause, we come to some startling conclusions. So the cause of the universe must be immaterial beyond space and time. Beyond space and time. Now there are only two things that can fit in this category. The first, abstract objects, and the second, an embodied mind. So we're faced with two worldviews. One starts in the beginning with mass energy, the particles, and everything is derivative, including information. The other says the exact opposite. Says the exact opposite. Says the exact opposite. Says the exact opposite. So in the first worldview, mass energy is primary and mind is derivative. In the other worldview, mind is primary and mass energy is derivative. Is derivative. Is derivative. Is derivative. And so far as tonight's lecture is concerned, it is the diametrical opposition between the worldview of materialism and the worldview of theism. It is a conflict between these two worldviews, but I want you to notice there are scientists on each side of it. Now, what's the, the better candidate? Now, abstract objects, the problem with them, with these abstract objects is they're causally defeat, even they can't cause anything. Like, for example, the number one can't cause anything. The simple law of arithmetic, 1 plus 1 equals 2, never brought anything into being. I wish it did. It never has put any money into my bank account. If I put a thousand pounds into the bank today and later another thousand pounds, the laws of arithmetic will rationally explain how it is that I now have two thousand pounds in the bank. But if I never put any money into the bank myself and simply leave it to the laws of arithmetic to bring money into being, I shall be permanently bankrupt. C.S. Lewis, with usual brilliance, grasped this years ago. The laws of nature produce no events. They state the pattern to which every event, if only it can be induced to happen, must conform. Just as the rules of arithmetic state the pattern to which all transactions with money must conform, if only you can get a hold of any money. Thus, in one sense, the laws of nature cover the whole field of space and time. In another, what they leave out is precisely the whole real universe. The incessant torrent of actual events which makes up true history, that must come from somewhere else. To think the laws can produce it is like thinking that you can create real money by simply doing sums. For every law says in the last resort, if you have A, then you will get B. But first catch your A. The laws will not do it for you. Now scientists love developing theories involving mathematical laws to describe natural phenomena which enable them to make predictions and they've done it with spectacular success. But most are aware I think that on their own the theories and laws that they find cannot create anything, let alone a universe. Yet Hawking seems to think they did. Professor Stephen Hawking says that modern science has established there was no need for God in the creation of the universe. In a new book, Hawking suggests that a theoretical framework known as M-theory can explain how the Big Bang was an inevitable consequence of the laws of physics. 
according to him, it is the laws of physics, not the will of God, that provide the real explanation as to how the universe came into being. The Big Bang, he argues, was the inevitable consequence of these laws. I quote, Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now a supernatural being, or God, is an agent who does something. Dismissing such an agent, Hawking ascribes creative power to physical law. But physical law is not an agent. Hawking, it seems to me, is making a classical category mistake by confusing two entirely different kinds of entity, physical law and personal agency. Our physical laws are a description, usually mathematical, of what normally happens under certain given conditions. This is surely obvious from the very first example that Hawking gives in his book, The Sun Rises in the East. But this law does not create the sun nor the planet Earth with east and west. It is descriptive and predictive, but not creative. Similarly, Newton's laws of gravitation doesn't create gravity or the matter in which gravity acts. In fact, it doesn't even explain gravity as Newton himself realized. But it's even worse. The laws of physics cannot even cause anything to happen. Newton's celebrated laws of motion never caused a pool ball to race across the table. That can only be done by people using a pool cue in the action of their muscles. Suppose to make matters clearer, we replace the universe by a jet engine, and we are asked to explain it. Shall we account for it by mentioning the personal agency of its inventor, Sir Frank Whittle? Or shall we, following Hawking, dismiss personal agency and explain the jet engine by saying it arose naturally from physical law? Now this would be absurd. It is obvious we need both levels of explanation in order to give a complete description. It is also obvious that the scientific explanation neither conflicts nor competes with the agent explanation. They complement one another. It is the same with explanations of the universe. God does not conflict or compete with the laws of physics as an explanation. God is actually the ground of all explanation in the sense that he is the ultimate cause in the first place of there being a world for the laws of physics to describe. Now, there's more to this because the laws of physics can explain how the jet engine works but not how it came to exist in the first place jet engine needed the intelligence and creative engineering work of Whittle. Indeed, come to think of it, the laws of physics plus Frank Whittle could not actually produce a jet engine on their own. There also needed to be some material subject to those laws that could be worked on by Whittle. Matter, ladies and gentlemen, may be humble stuff, but it is not produced by laws. I submit to you that the world of strict naturalism in which clever mathematical laws all by themselves bring the universe and life into existence is pure science fiction. Pure science fiction. Pure science fiction. Now Hawking here echoes Peter Atkins, a colleague at Oxford, a well-known atheist who believes that space-time generates its own dust in the process of its own self-assembly. Atkins dubs this the cosmic bootstrap principle, referring to the self-contradictory idea of a person lifting himself by pulling on his own boot laces. Philosopher of religion Keith Ward is surely right to say that Atkins' view of the universe is as blatantly self-contradictory as the name he gives to it, pointing out that it is logically impossible for a cause to bring about some effect without already being in existence. Ward concludes, between the hypothesis of God and the hypothesis of a cosmic bootstrap, there's no competition, there's no competition, there's no competition. We were always right to think that persons or universes who seek to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps are forever doomed to failure. What perhaps all this goes to show is that nonsense remains nonsense even when talked by world famous scientists. By world famous scientists. So the only alternative is an unbodied mind, what this call God, uh, an unbodied mind immaterial outside time and space.
So there's a God. Then you have to say, but sorry, where did God come from? It's not a question I hear often answered. In order to recognize that an explanation is the best, you don't have to have an explanation of the explanation. In order to recognize that an explanation is the best, you don't have to be able to explain the explanation. Folks, this is an elementary point in the philosophy of science. Suppose astronauts were to find on the backside of the moon a pile of machinery there that had not been left by American or Russian cosmonauts, uh, what would be the best explanation for that machinery? Well, clearly it would be some sort of extraterrestrial intelligence that had left the machinery there. And you don't have to have an explanation of who these extraterrestrials were or came from or how they got there or anything of that sort in order to recognize that the best explanation of this machinery is intelligent design. In order to recognize an explanation as the best, you don't have to have an explanation of the explanation. In fact, when you think about it, requiring that would immediately lead to an infinite regress of explanations. You would need an explanation of the explanation, but in order to recognize that as best, you need an explanation of the explanation of the explanation, and then an explanation of the explanation of the explanation of the explanation, of the explanation. and so that nothing could ever be explained. One of the outdated philosophical cliches, in my opinion, is that, well, who created God? We hear that all the time, and they think it's a baseball bat against the theists. But it's made of sponge. And let me tell you why. If we say, what caused the cause that caused the universe, then let's continue. What caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? Let's continue. Then what caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? Let's carry on. Then what caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? And that goes on and on and on backwards. But at one point, I have, I have to have an uncaused cause, or there would be nothing in existence today. Think of uh, a string of dominoes. You have a domino that knocks over a domino that knocks over a domino. I have to have a first domino, or that string of falling could never start. So in essence, to claim who created God or what caused the cause of the universe is equivalent of saying that we don't have a universe, that we don't Remember the premises of the argument I gave. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Something cannot come into being out of nothing. But if something is eternal and timeless, then it doesn't fall under that first premise. It doesn't need a cause. And the concept of God is the concept of an eternal, self-existent, necessary being. And therefore, the answer is simply that God is uncaused. He is self-existent. Dear Dr. Craig, one of the objections which has been raised is the first law of thermodynamics the rule that matter and energy can only be rearranged, or in other words, that matter is neither being created nor destroyed. Yeah, what's funny about this objection is that this is not an objection to the existence of God. This would be an objection to the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe. Mm. It would show that the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe is false, because according to that theory, all matter and energy even space and time themselves came into being at the moment of the Big Bang and are therefore not eternal. They haven't mm. always been there in the past. So if these fellows were right, all contemporary cosmologists who believe in the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe would be contradicting the laws of thermodynamics. And that's hardly the case. Why? 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 Well, because the laws of thermodynamics, in particular the law of the conservation of matter and energy, only applies once the universe comes into being. It applies at every moment, uh, at every time, and every point in the universe. But it doesn't apply to the origin of the universe itself. And that's why cosmologists don't consider that the law of conservation of uh, energy and mass is violated by the Big Bang Theory of the Origin of the Universe.
In fact, the uh, atheist fellow mentioned the laws of thermodynamics. He might have wanted to talk about the second law of thermodynamics, which says that in a closed system, uh, things tend toward increasing disorder. Now, the universe on the atheistic view is just a gigantic closed system because it is everything there is and there's nothing outside it. And what that implies is that given sufficient time, everything in the universe would grind down to a state of maximum disorder. So if the universe has existed for infinite time from eternity past, why is it that we don't find ourselves in this sort of thermodynamically disordered state? Uh, I think that the best answer to that is that the universe has not existed forever. It began a finite time ago in a low entropy condition, and the thermodynamic clock has been running ever since then. So the evidence of thermodynamics itself suggests that the universe and matter and energy are not infinite or eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning. To remind ourselves of the argument again, we have premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. And from that, we draw the conclusion that the universe had a cause. The universe had a cause. The universe had a cause. So we ask another question, what is the nature of this cause? And the nature of this cause upon conceptual analysis, which means critical thinking, thinking about this cause, we come to some startling conclusions. This cause must be one. The reason for this is because if we use the philosophical principle Occam's razor, which posits that we do not multiply entities beyond necessity, then we conclude it must be one. This cause must be uncaused, as we have already discussed the absurdity of an infinite regress of events, similarly with causes. This cause must be immaterial because it created the sum of all matter, which is the universe itself. So the cause of the universe must be immaterial beyond space and time. Beyond space and time. Now there are only two things that can fit in this category. The first, abstract objects, and the second, an embodied mind. An embodied mind. Now, what's the, the better candidate? Now, abstract objects, the problem with them, with these abstract objects, is they're causally defeat, meaning they can't cause anything. Like, for example, the number one can't cause anything. So the only alternative is an embodied mind, what theists call God. A, an embodied mind, immaterial, outside time and space. Significantly, brothers, sisters and friends, this cause must be personal. The reason I'm saying this is how else can a, an eternal cause bring into an existence a finite effect, the universe that had a beginning in time. It must have chosen the universe to come into existence and choice indicates a will and a will indicates a personality. So, we have concluded the traditional view on God that a transcendental, immaterial, uncaused, eternal being exists. Being exists. Being exists. Being exists. Being Coincidence, you look around and see the 
earth, the moon, the sun, and the sky, a beautiful creation of a So how could you deny, how can you deny the oneness of love?